and indeed thank you to the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution for providing this opportunity and platform to hold uh, this conversation today, uh, not just for the benefit of uh, ICODA members, but non-members uh, around the world as well that join us today, uh, which we're very grateful for. Um, I'm actually honored and privileged to have um, worked with both our guests today at various events in, in previous lives. Um, and I'm completely thrilled that they were both able uh, to accept my invitation uh, to join us today uh, and talk about and share their uh, respective experiences on ODR. Uh, our guests uh, will both take the floor uh, for 10 minutes each, one after the other, and then we'll jump straight into uh, uh, some Q&As. Um, and hopefully at the end of that, if uh, we're, everyone's still with us, I'll hand back to, to Colin, who will then field some questions from the audience if we still have time. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to invite uh, and welcome my friend, uh, Lord Briggs to take the floor. So Michael, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, Ramia. Can everybody hear all right? Good. Um, well, it's, it's, this is my first contact with the ICOVR, I think, and I'm completely delighted to have been invited. Um, I have to say, although it's my first contact with the organization, there are a number of very familiar faces uh, lurking away on the screen. Um, so uh, hello in particular to Orna and Amanda and others who, with whom I've worked in the past. Um, I want to be very brief in, in starting. I think I said up to 10 minutes and somebody will, will no doubt flash a very bright red light if I even look like going over it. Um, because I'm not in the front line of ODR or for that matter, the reform program at the moment, but I want just to put a little bit of flesh on the bones of where I come from um, when I'm answering questions because um, some of you may have heard of the Briggs report, but let me just say a little bit more about that. This is an opening in two parts, because the other bit I wanted to say something about was our experience of the pandemic in the Supreme Court and its effect on the way in which we deliver justice. True it is that we don't do much mediation in the Supreme Court, um, uh, but of course what we do is part of dispute resolution, and it has been an extraordinary experience um, to see how, when needs must, one can transfer extremely fast into a virtual online system away from papers and face-to-face -face hearings. Um, but just a little bit about the, the, the civil court structure review. It was actually, I think, 1915 and 16, sorry, 2015 and 16, after I'd recovered from doing what we call the Chancery Modernization Review in, in, in 2013. Um, what, it, it was a process which as Amir, who was a very, very faithful supporter of the review, will remember, involved an intense amount of consultation. We had three stages of consultation, um, two face-to-face -face and one written over a very, very busy year. And therefore it was the product, not just of my abstract thinking in a darkened room, but of a very large number of stakeholders' inputs. Um, it, it was also, the, the recommendations were also fully accepted both by the judiciary and by the Ministry of Justice, who, as you probably don't all know, run the court system in the UK in a form of 50-50 partnership, except of course the ministry holds the purse strings. Um, and I'm very happy to be able to say that our newly appointed Master of the Role, Sir Geoffrey Voss, has in some of his recent speeches, and you can easily Google them if you want to, emphatically supported the, jet, the direction of travel, um, which we initiated, well, I don't think initiated, but which we encouraged in the civil court structure review, both in treating online courts as an absolutely key way of providing accessible civil justice uh, at proportionate cost, and in a way which ordinary people could have access to and operate without the complete start to finish intermediation of lawyers. Doesn't mean to say there are no lawyers, they'll be vital for providing advice and uh, when necessary, skilled forensic advocacy services in court, but not needing to write every letter, lodge every document. 
um, uh, one of the mottos which I developed during that review was taking the A out of ADR uh, so that it is mainstream rather than alternative. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to see that that is a major heading in some of Sir Geoffrey Voss's recent lectures and very much very high on his list of objectives in the radical things which he wants to do with civil justice in his newly appointed position of head of civil justice. Um, that report was a way of buttressing the already by then started civil courts, well, no, not civil courts, court service reform program, which um, gathered pace thereafter. I had about a year after my uh, giving my report to assist in it um, before I was swept off into the Supreme Court um, and left just to do pure law. Um, and I think it's fair to say that it had gathered a splendid degree of momentum by the time I left. Uh, there was, of course, a worry when the pandemic struck that it would be for everybody connected with the courts, um, hands to the pumps. But I'm happy to say that the reform program has continued. I spent um, half an hour on the phone this morning, or actually on a, on a, on a Zoom this morning, I think it was a Teams this morning, um, with uh, my good friend, uh, Lord Justice Colin Burse, who is now the Deputy Head of Civil Justice doing the job I was doing then. Uh, and he confirmed, as indeed Sir Geoffrey makes clear in his speeches, that the program continues. Um, recent um, highlights or current highlights are that they, the, the online civil, civil money claims uh, pilot is continuing. The um, small claims mediation system within it is becoming an opt out rather than opt in service, which I think is a great development. Um, there is about to start the personal injuries claims portal and the whiplash claims portal, perhaps a slightly unfortunate name, but it means very small personal injury claims. Um, there, later this uh, year, I think actually later this month, the damages claims portal, which is where you go if you can't settle it with a pre-action process, is coming uh, online as a, a further pilot um, for professional users rather than a difference in person, because we're trying to develop or they are trying to develop processes that are not just for uh, litigants in person, but for lawyers as well. Uh, there is going to be a new online possession claims system to replace what's known to its friends as PCOL. Um, uh, and there is also going on some very interesting early neutral evaluation judicial pilots, particularly in Birmingham, to see whether uh, early neutral evaluation by, by district judges can provide a more proportionate and effective way of settling most, but not of course all claims. So that's that bit. The other part before I run out of my 10 minutes it is the pandemic. When the pandemic struck the Supreme Court, three or four of us, I think I was the original guinea pig, had given up paper and were doing our work entirely digitally using screens, although of course, carrying our laptops into court for face-to-face -face hearings. When the pandemic struck, we had about a week to bring everybody into that situation, to give up paper completely, for us all to go to our separate homes around the country, and that includes Northern Ireland and Scotland, to continue the work of the court. The work of the court then continued entirely virtually, and we didn't have to adjourn for more than a day or two a single hearing other than when somebody in the council team was ill, usually with COVID, and the parties themselves requested an adjournment. So we did manage to continue our dispute resolution process with a very rapid jump online um, to take up, as it were, full time what until then was really being piloted by some of us. And it has continued since. And I think the really important message to take away from it is that it has proved the efficacy of virtual justice um, in cases where admittedly there's no cross-examination of witnesses. We're talking about legal submissions, of course, about points of law. It has also proved that the process can remain fully open and transparent. 
because just as all our hearings were previously broadcast simultaneously live online around the world, so all our virtual hearings have been so broadcast as well. And nothing happens even in a virtual hearing, um, apart from making sure everybody's got their microphone switched on, that is not simultaneously broadcast live and with no possibility of, of turning off the broadcast. Once it's on, it's on, unless something goes wrong with the IT. So we have been able virtually to continue with transparent justice. Uh, sorry, my computer has just turned off. Give me a moment. Right. Um, I think post the pandemic, that process of virtual hearings is going to continue wherever it is a better and more economic and proportionate way of our delivering justice than face to face in the building in Parliament Square. And it will particularly continue in our work as the Judicial Provi um, Committee of the Privy Council, where we are the final court of appeal for about 27 countries around the world who have chosen to continue with us. It's not something we impose in any colonial way, they've chosen it. Uh, and for whom we therefore provide justice. And we will be able to do so for people who are often not at all well off at proportionate cost by using a virtual system. And I'm quite clear that a paper-free process is going to continue after the pandemic nonstop. I can't see that I will ever go back to paper and I will be quite surprised if any of my colleagues do either. Um, Meanwhile, and simultaneously, my wife, who is a senior commercial mediator, known to some of you as Beverly Ann Rogers, has gone straight into virtual for mediation using the Zoom platform, which has, has proved to be an extraordinarily good mediation platform, not least because of the ability to create breakout rooms, to move people around from one place to another, and to maintain confidentiality. And she tells me, and I pass it on to you, that she thinks that although when she can, some mediation clients will want to do it face-to-face, -face. in fact, she's going to do a face-to-face -face one tomorrow, um, others will want to continue virtually, and all importantly, the pre-mediation process, where you introduce clients who've never mediated before to the process, you introduce yourself, you start to establish a relationship of trust and confidence, all before the day of the mediation. That can now be done virtually, uh, with the parties seeing each other, seeing each other's faces in a way that generates a flying start to the mediation on the day, which was never possible uh, by a pre-mediation process that just consisted of picking up the telephone to solicitors. So that's all I've got to say by way of introduction, um, and I'm looking forward to the questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lord Briggs, for those opening remarks. Uh, can I now invite Master McLeod to take the floor? Well, thanks very much, Emmy. Can I, can I just endorse um, what Lord Briggs said about um, how welcome it is to see that we've got now uh, the new master of the role, Geoffrey Voss and Colin Burrs, um, in the seat, because I think it's well known that there's a lot of commitment there to technology and to, to advancing how we do things in terms of online courts and, o, and ODR. I think that's a really great thing to, sit, to say. To see. Um, I should say that everything I say is without any kind of official capacity um, I'm on various committees and so on but everything I say is just my own my own view I don't speak for anyone uh, and I'm not a, a decision maker in, in, in the process what I'm really going to be saying I think is actually more um, a mix of science fiction and science fact in the sense that I'm going to be quite forward looking uh, and quite blue sky thinking uh, because I'm quite enthusiastic about deploying technology to ensure that we use court resources in a way that practically means that the maximum number of people can get their cases resolved satisfactorily or indeed resolve their disputes without having to have a case. Um, so starting from there, um, where do I see the future of ODR going? I think that's a layered question. Um, being realistic, um, computers aren't going to start adjudicating cases themselves anytime soon in anything significant, I think. So ADR, ODR, I think, is going to remain really about the use of technology facilitating essentially human processes um, once one reaches decision making points or negotiation points or media. So I think it's going to be for the medium future at least going to be primarily about that facilitative and access function 
that we see through technology. And of course, we know from the AI related to natural language processing that it is very difficult uh, for computers to read English. So we're quite a long way off uh, in terms of, of having significant amounts of AI in substantive law. But I, I do want to paint a, an ambitious uh, portrait, if you like, from my own mind of how I see things for the, for the future in the slightly longer term. As I say, the sort of blue sky thinking. And it seems to me that if we choose our goals carefully uh, at the outset, technology can make huge improvements to what we do. And I think there are, uh, there are several aspects to that, all of which feed into the rule of law, all of which feed into access to justice in the Wolfian sense and indeed in Lord Bingham's sense as augmenting the rule of law. Um, the first aspect I think I, I underscore really is the familiar one, the simple, because it's a sort of logically simple, rather it's technically complex, but logically simple notion of algorithmic AI channeling disputes towards appropriate dispute resolution processes. Now that's close, I think, to Lord Briggs's notion in his report of triage, uh, perhaps automated triage. But here what I'm thinking is systems help the litigants to identify the type of case they've got and perhaps use a degree of AI to do that and actually channel would-be litigants or disputants towards appropriate mediation and ODR services proportionate in cost to the type of dispute, uh, appropriate perhaps for the, the particular nature of the, of the case. So uh, you might have a case with two Urdu speakers directing towards someone who can use that language when helping to resolve a dispute. Or if you have a dispute concerning package holidays, moving them towards a low cost service provider to assist with dispute resolution and which handles that type of, of work. So I, I think we can achieve quite an effective triage system if we actually harness algorithmic AI at quite a deep level and plug it straight into service providers for ADR provision. And um, that would enable us to have uh, systems, if you like, quality control as well, which I think could be quite useful. At a second and somewhat more uh, ambitious level, it seems to me that if you incorporate uh, computational in the court system, then the judicial management of cases can increase effectiveness. Now, that's not strictly ODR, but it's certainly an online element of dispute resolution. And I think, for example, if, if we have a system of air traffic control, if we have a, an arrangement whereby parties can be directed towards let's say, a judicial neutral evaluator or a court, which has space in its list. And if those parties are prepared to travel, then those parties can gain a quicker hearing and quicker resolution. It, if you like, the flexible use of court resources and not focusing necessarily always on just using local court, local to the parties. Uh, and so if there is any physical travelling to be done, then they can be channeled to, to the right court. And even if there isn't physical travelling to be done, then a, a judicial mediator or a arbitrator can be made available anywhere according to their diary and how free they are. And that can augment that efficiency of dispute resolution. And I think if we integrated that into the court system, we could plug that, for example, example into direct access to expert witness diaries. If there were... Uh, authorised court experts, for example, in personal injury, if a system can know which experts are booked for which cases on which days nationally, then a system can ensure appropriate experts can be booked for dates when they're available and trials can take place or hearings can take place or mediations with experts can take place in the most efficient way at the earliest date. So what I'm advocating here is a, a very tight integration of uh, algorithmic AI into the court system and into the dispute resolution system, but also integration across service providers, such as experts and ODR providers. I think the third level, if you like, is, is the most um, ambitious uh, a, 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 a approach, and that would be to actually start to think in terms of how we might bring computers into assisting the substantive resolution process uh, itself. Uh, and here's, here's where we're definitely in the, in the era of something close to science uh, fiction, um, but I think it would be possible even with today's um, technology to start to consider looking at carefully chosen, uh, relatively narrow, well-defined legal fields uh, and 
expert systems which know only about that legal field and to choose disputes which have a, a fairly narrow range of formats of evidence and a reasonably tight range of likely outcomes and to start to think in terms of um, the computational co-pilot, as I've called it uh, in other talks before, the idea that if you're a mediator or an arbitrator, uh, you might actually have a system which has access to databases of process judgments and an expert system knowledge of quite defined areas of law and can assist the mediator in putting forward proposals and taking that a step further uh, where you have litigants in person, a system which actually just based on past cases says what it thinks statistically the light likely outcome might be before the parties have gone anywhere really near a court. Now, those sorts of systems I think are worth experimenting with when we're talking about some of the smaller cases, which actually make up the bulk of the court time when one looks at the entire court system. Those are the sorts of things that could alleviate uh, strain and backlog in the system by putting forward some sort of proposal, which once we've tested these systems, once we know that they're fairly reliable, once we've got them to the point where we can reasonably rely on them, one could have a system whereby if a party actually unreasonably doesn't adopt a uh, suggested solution, then they may be at some cost risk if they then go to court later. That's probably 20 years down the line. But I can certainly foresee, and I would like to see, uh, the beginnings of integrating AI into substantive analysis of, of decisions and substantive prediction in, in small level claims. But there are some difficulties with the practicalities of that. There's the technical difficulties of language processing. And there's two other really quite important difficulties, which I think feed into the whole of ODR um, suit resolution generally. And that is that there's a lack of background data. There's a lack of available judgments at the low level the everyday disputes, we don't get written judgments, we just get uh, the district giving an extemporary judgment. So we don't have that data as to how cases are actually being decided. And perhaps there needs to be a process of collecting that data. Uh, and lastly, for published judgments, we have a system in the UK where third parties traditionally have always, always published those, not in the Supreme Court, they instigated very wisely in my view, their own publication of judgments. But in the rest of the system, it's generally a question of pi private publication, maybe under the guise of charity, Bailey, but third party providers. And of course, those third party providers impose conditions as to licensing and as to copyright. And I think we're going to have to seriously consider, uh, as I've been mooting elsewhere recently, some sort of open licensing arrangement whereby judgments are stamped, if you like, with a judicial creative commons license and be computationally processed without breaching the license on which they've uh, been released to the public. So that, that's, my, that's my kind of mountaintop. Um, looking looking far into the distance, coming right back to earth. What's it been like for me in court re working remotely? It's been brilliant. Um, I've worked all day today remotely. Virtually every case I've done during lockdown has been remote, just going in for the occasional one. And it, it really has worked very well in, indeed, using a range of flexible technologies, phone, Teams, Zoom, you name it. Um, but I think as a forced experiment, I think it's been quite successful in my view. Thanks, Anya. Well, thank you very much. Master McLaren, thank you for your uh, mountain top view. That mountain top view makes my life uh, a lot easier today because one of the questions I had for you specifically, you've already answered about um, uh, judges' judgments being published and, and those publishers then uh, holding on and dictating how uh, the words and the judgments uh, are used um, uh, or disseminated. So. Thank you very much for that. that. That's one of my questions out of the window. Um, the Q&A session now, uh, and thank you both uh, for your input. The Q&A session, really most of my questions, uh, I'd love to take credit for them. In fact, I will take credit for them because I collated them, but they're not my questions. Um, uh, the questions will be for both of you uh, because both of you will have a view, comments, observations. I would like uh, Lord Briggs to answer first followed by Master McLeod, but uh, with the caveat that I have one or two questions, if we have time today uh, for uh, specifically one or the other, um, but if we can jump straight in, I know Colin and Graham have mentioned India, so it seems a, an apt place to start. Uh, let's, let's start in India, because that's where quite a lot of 
uh, ODR traction is happening at the moment. The government there in India, uh, and this question is for both of you, the government in India has recently initiated uh, a major initiative expanding ODR, uh, but they've decided to focus uh, on creating the framework for ODR uh, to be adopted by private entities uh, rather than uh, as opposed to uh, the courts uh, hosting and building ODR solutions directly. I just wonder uh, whether that approach would work in the UK. Uh, Lord Briggs. Well, it slightly depends what you mean by ODR. Um, in one sense, once the courts are going online with online courts um, or digitizing their processes, uh, so that everything's happening through some sort of um, computerized medium. The service they're providing is online dispute resolution. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, it is undoubtedly the case that we don't want, I think, any kind of government or court service monopoly over dispute resolution. Um, it's much better, I think, that we have a hybrid approach where in some areas where it's most efficient to do so, the court service develops or offers their own um, dispute resolution solution, whether it's judicially, um, judicial early neutral evaluation or the cheap and cheerful telephone mediation you can get on the online civil money claim service, in fact, you do get unless you opt out of it, um, because they are, on statistics, effective. They work. But equally, we wouldn't be doing even those things effectively if we weren't kept up to the mark by it being done privately as well and in a way that the court system can learn from. And equally, the court system is never going to be well enough funded to offer every desirable kind of dispute resolution system across the board. Um, it seems to me that dispute resolution is bound to continue to be privately offered, whether by mediators, early neutral evaluation, MedArb, uh, or various forms of digitized and sometimes AI-based systems, such as is provided by eBay and Amazon, for example. Although, of course, you're, you're tied in there because you were an eBay customer or an Amazon customer when you bought the goods. Um, where I think the Indians look to me, although I haven't studied the thing in detail, to be doing something cleverly is that the more digitized we get, the more important it is that one can seamlessly move across the digital dispute resolution system in a way that Victoria was describing so that you, you, can, you don't have to, as it were, shut down one digital process and start all over again in a completely different one where the two processes are incapable of talking to each other because they use such different software. And there, I think there is scope for a frameworks approach. Certainly the court service has adopted that approach for the multifarious different offerings which they are generating during the reform program. They're trying to do so on the basis of the same technological platform so that they can work together. Uh, the new master of the rails, Jeffrey Voss, has got this concept of the funnel so that there is, if you like, a single dispute resolution point of entry from which you can then be guided into the most effective complete solution to your problem once the court's got some grip on what the problem is. Uh, and I don't think he has in mind that that would be purely a solution provided by the court service. I'm sure he would have in mind that that would include solutions provided by private, private offerings. The, the other area, apart from what I would call digital synchronization, is obviously the problem of quality control. Because the court service, if it recommends a mediator, has got to be have a sufficient level of confidence that that mediator is suitably trained or qualified. And that would apply, I think, to any kind of dispute resolution offering, which the court service is being invited to offer to litigants who have come to court for resolution of their dispute. It's been tried in various counter courts where they build a local panel of mediators and where the, the case management judge can say, I'm gonna send this to the panel and you'll be run up by a, a private mediator. 
But then, of course, the court has to have a basic level of confidence that that panel has people on it who are up to the job. Thank you. Um, Mr. McLeod? Well, th thanks very much. Yes, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a great believer in, in you know, the facilitative state uh, in the sense that uh, if, if you consider Geoffrey Voss's idea of the funnel, um, the state there doesn't have to run everything. What it can do is provide an access point, uh, a way to um, channel people in the right direction. And you'll have gathered from, from, from what I said in my opening remarks that, that I do favour uh, the idea of the continuation of what is already, of course, present in the common law and is, is everybody's right. And that is to go to third party dispute resolution providers. It's not it's not something which which is a right that people have to be granted. But what we can do is ensure quality if we do have some state involvement in the channeling process. Now, what by state, I don't necessarily mean courts and, and I, I just follow what Lord Briggs said one might for example have citizens advice bureau with people who have done the training in assisting to channel people in the right directions uh, perhaps assisted with, with digital tools for example um, paralegals here could be incredibly useful um, there's a question I think that popped up on the question list about um, the role of paralegals actually the paralegals could play a key role here in terms of being people who are qualified in assisting people through this process and channeling them in the right direction at affordable cost so there are lots of models for that channeling system but I do favour a degree of, of, of state um, authorization and oversight whilst deploying third third party providers. I think it's going to, for the foreseeable, foreseeable future, probably going to be largely a human process. Um, but uh, someone on the, on the pop-up questions was raising, I think it was Marnie Landon, was raising the question about how are you going to get a triage process that involves computers when we can't yet really do very much with natural language processing. And this really takes me back to what I was saying about having a narrow use case, about having um, quite carefully chosen domain you're dealing with where you've actually got the capacity potentially for knowing that the types of evidence you get fall within a narrow range and the types of disputes are within a narrow range so that you don't necessarily get into general AI you get into very domain specific expert systems I, I think it is worth trying to build on that and to work on that even the existing technologies thank you thank you both uh, let's let's uh, this is obviously quite interesting what's going on in India um, at the moment there, there seems to be a lot of traction with, with ODR. Let's, uh, let's move from India and focus on uh, uh, Colin's backyard in the US. Um, uh, and in the US, there, there are many concerns uh, uh, about the use of AI and algorithmic justice in the courts, largely due to the, the risk of systemic bias and the lack of transparency. Um, how can the courts, do you think, leverage uh, technology uh, while not undermining public confidence uh, in the fairness and impartiality of the judiciary? Lord Briggs. Well, at the end of the day, there is a question which is not for the courts or for the judges, or for that matter, for government, but for the people ex ex exercising, if you like, a democratic right to decide by whom or by what they want to be judged. I mean, putting it at its most crude, do you want your dispute with your neighbor to be determined by a fellow human being or by a robot? And um, to my mind, that's not a decision for judges to make or any officials to make. It's a decision for society to make. It's a point I was actually spending a lot of time on during the civil structure review, as Amir would probably remember. And the answer, of course, is unlikely to be a uniform answer. There will be types of dispute where the value at risk is so low and the cost of getting it decided by a human being so high that you prefer to have it done by a robot. And that's, of course, the key to the success of the small claims dispute resolution processes run by people like eBay. Um, but there will be others where they involve where you live, where they involve your liberty, where they involve your family and your children, or the future of your business or your livelihood, where my guess is that people will ultimately want to be able to get in front of the judge and have their day in court and have their case resolved by a human being. But the, the big challenge, I think, is, is 
how we ensure that in, if you like, providing horses for courses, that is robots where it's obviously preferable, but human beings where the people want it, we are properly responsive to society's wishes in that respect. And I don't think this is a technical question. I think this is a societal political question in which judges, when it comes to politics, should keep their mouths shut. That's a great answer, especially on local election day here in the UK. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. In fact, I, I need to go and vote straight after this. You've just reminded me. Uh, uh, Master McLeod, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, you, well, I, 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 I endorse that. These are fundamental questions about the nature of justice and judges don't well, perhaps in the Supreme Court they do sometimes, but certainly at my level, we don't make decisions about the very nature of justice, where, where it's about the direction of, of policy matter, and, and it really is for the democratic uh, process. Um, one thing we've got to be very careful of in, in any integration of technology into, into the court process is obviously coded bias. Um, and I, I'm sure people are probably aware of the, um, the well-known example of the Google Translate bias, uh, entirely accidentally built into a system used uh, gender bias in terms of how it translates. So I, I put on the screen here some Hungarian on one side of the screen. Hungarian doesn't use gender pronouns when it's talking about um, yeah. uh, verbs. And the translation by Google Translate on the right. So it takes a non-gendered piece of text and assumes the gender. So we've got she is beautiful, he is clever, she washes the dishes, he builds, and so on. Probably, and, and you can create examples as much as you like. It works with Finnish as well, for those interested. Those sorts of things can creep up on you uh, in any system, and you can accidentally build in biases. And that process of trying to avoid that is par excellence something that, that is a governmental and legislative and supervisory function that judges can't, can't be responsible. We can try to adhere to it. We can try to monitor it. But the design and creation of those systems and the appropriate safeguards is definitely a policy matter. Well, thank you for that. And you know what I'm going to be doing tonight when I'm going to be Googling into the wee hours, uh, Hungarian and Swinish, uh, uh, Finnish sentences. But thank you for that. Uh, this one's specifically uh, for you, Lord Briggs. There's a little bit of a preamble. Um, uh, but um, in your vision, uh, specifically chapter six of your report, on the civil court structure review included uh, the forecast that unlike the paper system providing litigants uh, a blank box in which to describe their claim, uh, the online version, the, uh, the online court would provide interactive triage designed to assist them articulate their claim uh, and to upload, upload their evidence. Uh, the question is, uh, is digitalization safe in the hands of the court service? Um, insofar as the court service has made a start on this process with the online civil money claims process, and it's a pretty rudimentary start, but I don't say that in any way critically because it's a huge task. I think they have deserved our confidence in the essentially pragmatic stage by stage, <coughs> um, do it in building bricks one by one and get them out into a form of public testing as soon as you can um, way, which is good. Um, on the other hand, of course, if it were me, I'd make this top priority, but I fully appreciate that the court service and the government have other priorities, not least now we're in a serious financial situation after the pandemic. There are very clever people out there doing the same sort of research and development privately with a view to offering it in complex cases to lawyers, but also being able to offer it to the public. And um, I don't begin to assume that those very clever people are either going to be found and engaged by the court service or necessarily even want to work for the court service. They may be entrepreneurial people, funny enough, my youngest son is one of them at the moment, um, who are doing this work and who absolutely don't want to do it within a 
governmental or civil service straitjacket. Um, and therefore, my answer is, it's not so much a question of, of, of can you trust the court service to do it? I, I think they're doing a good job with the money they've got and the priorities they've got, but it's taking a long time. Um, I remember the wonderful um, system put together by the Dutch for family dispute resolution, um, which unfortunately bit the dust because there wasn't enough support for it. Um, I, I think we have to accept that in order to get the best, we will have systems that are launched and fail, systems that compete with each other out of which the best will emerge. So the answer I suppose to your question is, is no, but I don't by that mean no, because the government's got it wrong with the efforts that they're putting into it. Um, I think a wonderfully successful example is in our country is the Traffic Penalty Tribunal, which was an extraordinary partnership between a government appointed person in charge of the process. It's a wonderful little online court for dealing with parking fines and people who don't pay uh, their tolls when they go through the Dartford Tunnel. Um, and it was developed in partnership with a very small private organization. And the two worked together with the most splendid synergy and anybody who's ever used it will know it's a really excellent system. It was there years before the online civil money claims system, uh, but my goodness, uh, it worked. So I, I have a very open mind about whose hard work is going to prevail at the end of the day. But I think the government's doing a good job as one of the many people who are trying. Thank you. Well, 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 Thank you. Uh, Master McLeod, any, anything to add? I, I think I have to say I agree. Um, I, don't, I don't need to add anything to that. I, I think the reality is they are doing a pretty good job, but as with all things, competition and a multiplicity of ideas, diversity of ideas is a good thing. Um, I'm conscious of time, but I've, I've just got one or two more uh, very quickly. Uh, one or two were slightly pointy, but the, uh, the next question is for both of you. Is the judiciary pro-mediation. I think that's what we need to really get our teeth into. Um, Lord Briggs, well, from your I'm experience. Sure the very short answer is yes. Um, nobody who, who has read the English authorities will doubt that I am pro-mediation. Um, but then as the chairman of the Civil Mediation Council said at the annual conference after I decided the PGS case, if I hadn't decided it that way, the PGF2 case, I wouldn't have got any supper when I got home because my wife's a mediator. Um, but my, my approval of mediation goes much deeper than that. It's interesting to see how that case has um, stood the test of time. It's been actively um, endorsed by none other than Sir Geoffrey Voss. Uh, in, I'm sorry? In, in the, can I still be heard? I can certainly hear fine. Oh, good. In Rickard and Holloway, that was in 2015, um, the, the, the underlying con where he said no dispute was too intractable for mediation. Um, uh, it's been actively endorsed uh, in DSM and Blackboard Football Club. Um, no defence, however strong by itself, justifies a failure to engage in any kind of alternative dispute resolution. And these are, of course, all judgments which led to ghastly consequences in terms of cost for the people who had not engaged in a dispute resolution process. Uh, a little bit of cold water was poured on it in a case um, called um, Gore and Nahid by my dear friend, or Justice Patton in 2017. Um, but I, I don't think that cold water uh, uh, has lasted. It, it evaporated, and I think the general thrust of judicial pronouncements in judgments is thoroughly in support of mediation. But I'm equally sure that that's true of judges when speaking as it were out of court and making speeches, uh, none more so than the current master of the roles. Uh, and, and I should add that his comments in um, Ricard and Holloway were supported and agreed to by the then Lord Chief Justice as well. Um, so I think the answer is a, a plain and untrammeled yes. If you ask, are judges all in support of compulsory mediation? I think you get a much more nuanced answer. I think probably most aren't. And I would also say 
that those who think that everybody should mediate think that mediations only produce justice, that is just settlements rather than merely settlements, if the parties to the mediation know that the party who thinks he's being oppressed in the mediation process has a quick route to a trial at proportionate cost in a proper transparent justice process. In other words, it's the backup of a trial judge waiting to deal with the case if the mediation isn't going the right way that produces just settlements rather than just settlements. Thank you. And uh, Master McLeod? Uh, well, I, I trained as mediator before I uh, was appointed to the bench, so I, I, I suppose I, I uh, walk the walk, or did walk the walk. Um, I, 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 yes, like I think probably all judges, I'm, I'm a supporter of, of mediation, and I think you probably find the judiciary is, unless you can winkle out someone very crusty in some backwater somewhere who, who doesn't necessarily know what, what it is, but I suspect that pretty much it's ubiquitous that judges would be very much supporters of mediation because of course we see cases particularly at first instance where um, people are ruined by the traditional boundary dispute or, or whatever um and and where where the costs just run out of control and it can ruin people's lives it can be pretty uh, it's pretty distressing for the judge to see really you don't want that to happen you don't want to have to give a judgment which <laughs> resolves the resolves the dispute but uh, metaphorically kills the patient uh, that's a denial, really, of real justice. Insofar as, as compulsory uh, ADR was mentioned, I, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I would favour mandatory use of an ombudsman if there is a relevant ombudsman. Um, I, I, I think a little like JR, you should be required to go through the necessary steps that are appropriate for your dispute uh, in ombudsman. Um, before you issue a claim, or if you do issue a claim, as is your right, then you may be at risk of paying an enhanced court fee or something of that sort. Um, because I do think that's, a, that's an, an important way of encouraging people to use the already available uh, ADR systems, which do work very well. Um, and I, I'm also a great supporter of judicial early neutral evaluation. Um, my judgment in Telecom Centre in Sanderson uh, talked about that. And, and indeed, I've as I think it's fairly unusual in the High Court, I have actually done a judicial early neutral evaluation with the parties present, uh, which did lead to settlement a week afterwards. Uh, so it can work. Uh, and I got thank yous from both sides and it saved a very nasty dispute between an institution and someone. Who was there. Uh, and um, that was very satisfying to see. So uh, yes, yes, I think the, the short answer is yes and the longer answer is the one I've given. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, my final question is to you, Lord Briggs, um, and uh, really just your reflections. You were very heavily involved with the court modernization uh, whilst at the Court of Appeal. And I just wondered whether you would share with, with the audience your biggest takeaways from that period. Well, I think my biggest takeaway in terms of what I learned was that when I asked thousands and thousands of consultees in dozens of public meetings whether anybody would thought whether anybody would advise their friend to go to court as a proportionate way of resolving a civil dispute where the value at risk was less than 25,000 pounds. Nobody ever answered yes under our then current system. Um, and um, that was a big takeaway for me about what was wrong with our then current system. We're only, in my view, at the early stages of putting it right. And my greatest wish is that getting triage properly built into the online civil money claim system was prioritized more than it has been. It doesn't mean to say there hasn't been work on it, and it doesn't mean that it's not on the worksheet, that it hasn't got there yet. And that, to my mind, is the absolute key that would turn it into a revolutionary winner rather than what some people might call, um, uh, what was the old one called? MCOL Mark II. <clears throat> um, MCOL is still alive and kicking, interestingly, uh, which yeah. is the old 10-year-old or 15-year-old money claims online, first generation online system. But the, the, the vital revolution is, is triage. I can see Graham Ross and I saw his question, well, we haven't got it yet in the online civil money claims court. And you're right, we haven't. 
It doesn't mean to say it's not being worked on. Uh, and the people who really have led the way in this are still, I think, the Canadians um, with their civil resolution tribunal, where they put that right up front in their design process uh, and, uh, and launched it with triage from day one. Yeah, so that's my, right. Christmas, that's my Christmas wish, uh, and that's my biggest takeaway. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I do remember that because I was at many of those public meetings all around the UK way back then uh, when we were allowed to travel all over the place. Uh, but thank you for that. Thank you both uh, for uh, this conversation. And I, I would certainly love to uh, now hand back to, uh, to Colin uh, in the few minutes that we have left. So sorry, we've monopolized your time. Oh, so many great questions. Um, and and uh, maybe I'll just surface one or two out of the chat. We have an embarrassment of riches of topics to address. But one for Master McLeod, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about AI. Um, if if uh, an AI or machine language service provider wanted to work in the courts, how do you think they could get their hands on the data? Who should they talk to? Who would be the appropriate uh, channel for them to, to try and get started? Well, I, I think this, this obviously goes back to, you know, to one of the points that I raised about this historic reality that we don't have a state uh, repository of judgments. Um, and we don't, have, we don't have anything like a digitized repository, let alone a paper repository. Um, so if I write a judgment, it goes to private providers, it goes to Bailey, it goes uh, perhaps to Lawtel or to other providers. It doesn't, in fact, go to a state-sponsored or um, affiliated uh, location or body, although I could have my judgment put on the court file, and perhaps that ought to be a first step, but maybe whenever a written judgment is, is given, it is at least kept reliably on the digital file. The court rules, of course, allow public access to uh, the records of the court. Um, the case painfully too close to my heart would be Cape and Dring, um, which uh, Lord Briggs was uh, one of the judges deciding in the Supreme Court, which is precisely about public access to the records of the court. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, 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 judgments are, are, I assume, crown copyright. So I, I've always had a slight difficulty with how third party providers are purporting to attach license restrictions. I suppose it's on the formatting. But I would have thought that there's no in principle uh, obstruction to um, people who wish to obtain at least the basic access to the records of the court using their rights under the court rules. There are discretionary powers if you want to go beyond that. Um, but a first step would be to make sure that judgments are actually kept and not only published through third party providers. And as I said, to make sure actually that the licensing arrangements are clear. And I, as I said in my little talk, I do favour um, the creation of something like a judicial creative commons license, which would allow um, uh, Commercial or non-commercial distribution would require the same license or, or no more restrictive license to be included, would not allow the judgment, but would allow it to be digitally processed, which falls somewhere within the Creative Commons licensing scheme, but doesn't quite fit any of the categories. If I slapped one of those on every one of my judgments, then I, then I think that effectively would mean that any third party who picked that up off any source would be entitled then to process it. I think it may need a degree of law reform and certainly a degree of administrative reform because at the moment, most records would in fact be either paper or wouldn't even contain the judgments. Right, right. I love can the I idea say, of it. Please. Can I, can I just add break. to that? Yeah. Um, the Chinese are streets ahead of us on this, this front. They have taken the trouble to compile a total database of all their dispute resolution by judges in the Chinese courts at all levels. They publish a staggering amount every day, and it is done in a form which, as I understand, is AI readable. Um, the only worry of saying, well, perhaps we should simply follow the Chinese lead, because we simply haven't got it at the moment, uh, and that's something which the reform program leaders are aware of. I've been in committees where we've discussed it. Um, we simply haven't got it. We're nowhere near getting it. Uh, and, but the worry is that the Chinese system is now able to have a, a process whereby the human performance on a daily basis of their human judges is monitored by their Ministry of Justice by reference to what their computers tell them ought to be the outcome of the cases they're deciding. <laughs> now, do we actually want that in this country? <laughs> So, you know, we do have to be terribly careful 
if you make a database like that, about what use is then allowed to be made of it? Well, and I think in France, the judges even took action to make it illegal to track the data about performance of judges because they didn't want to be subject to that level of scrutiny. But I think we all know, and Marnie makes this point too, AI, the way it works today, is nowhere near the promise of where AI is going to go. But the only way we're going to get there is if we can feed the, the AI's data. So without that, I mean, the two of you are in a position where you might be able to actually free up some of that data that can help us train those AIs that can get us to the point that I think uh, uh, Master McLeod was talking about looking from the top of the mountain. There's so many other great questions, but I do want to respect your time. Uh, so I think, I think maybe we should call it there. Um, so let me just, once again, can I please have a round of applause from all of our participants for our excellent guests, Master McLeod and Lord Briggs. Thank you. This was a wonderful session. We would love to have you back. As you can see, we had about 20 questions we couldn't get answered. So uh, we would have more than enough grist for the mill for another session. But thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules. And thank you everyone for joining us today. This was a wonderful session. So with that, thank you, Amir, for your wonderful facilitation. Thank you, Graham, for running our membership efforts. And everyone, please stay safe and healthy. And uh, we we will achieve nirvana together in the justice sector. One day. Thank you very much.